Excuse me. Okay, you should be able to show your camera at some point. So I propose that you start. So the next, uh, yes, now we see your screen, perfect. Uh, yes, perfect, okay. So the next talk will be given by Francisco Vargas and it's again on uh, diffusion, but also with some variational inference in the picture. So the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so just like I said, um, the talk's gonna be a bit about how do we pour um, diffusion is mostly to the sampling problem uh, with, with a VI flavor uh, rather than traditional MCMC. Uh, okay, wait, yeah. So just like a very simple high level example uh, to just motivate the different things we go over in this talk. So think of a quick thought experiment. Think of a, a town that in this case is generated by stable diffusion uh, where a bunch of students are making their way across the campus. Uh, so, you know, the students start up distributed randomly. Um, in this case, they're mice and they reach a target point at some point. So um, the point here is that, you know, there's lots of variations. You, know, you can think of these students as, as being random variables in a way, and there's many different ways in which the students can uh, go from point A to point B. This is the general theme of the talk. Like we wanna navigate from some starting distribution to some terminal distribution. And um, yeah, let's, I mean, like the, what we might define as a shortest path is, you know, depending here in this case, subject to the, you know, the, the, the roadways, the pavements that you have, the buildings of this particular city. So maybe there's a, there's a quite clear notion of what uh, good transport is here uh, from the starting to the end point. And, you know, you could think of a more optimal transport, I guess, in a Euclidean sense is that you just go directly to the point, um, but you can't really do that here, right? You'd be breaking through buildings among other things. So it's the, just the, the main point of this example is that, you know, there's many different ways to navigate between two different distributions. And, you know, the, the path that you take might depend a lot on um, the particular goal that you have in mind. Uh, for most of this talk, we'll be trying to motivate paths or uh, such that are not necessarily optimal, but are preferable in a computational sense rather than maybe this, this semi-physical sense here. So, you know, more concretely, like a lot of the talk is going to be related to the previous talk a bit, but in the context of sampling again, is that we have a source and a target distribution and we want to navigate in between them, right? So ultimately we just want to learn a sampler. We don't care too much about what happens in between, but we would like for it to be, you know, maybe learnable or fast and among other things. And just, just a, a quick picture that shows you that, you know, you can navigate between two distributions in, in very different and arbitrary ways. So the general notation just that will be consistent throughout the talk is going to be pi zero will be the source distribution, pi t is just going to be the intermediate uh, interpolating flow, and pi capital T, uh, the endpoint target distribution. The two problems that we'll be referring to, although the main focus is going to be problem one, are the sampling problem. Uh, so we want to generate uh, random numbers that are approximately distributed according to some pre-specified distribution or density. Um, and the generative modeling problem is given some samples, uh, can we learn a model that can reproduce these samples? So just to go ahead a little bit into more detail about these. So for the sampling problem, to be complementary to the generative modeling problem, we have access to a density that we can evaluate up to a normalizing constant. So there's this gamma function here. We're, you know, we're able to evaluate this for the purpose of this talk. We assume we can uh, take derivatives of it as well. Our goal is to generate samples according to this pi distribution. So one way to look at it is we want to start from a pi zero and transport that, uh, transport that to our target density. Conversely, the uh, general molding problem is we have some underlying density uh, that we have only access to through samples. We'd like to maybe estimate such target density or simply just generate high quality samples. And this can be thought again of, of a transport map, maybe in the other direction. Uh, but again, it's it's very similar. When I go from a simple distribution to one that uh, reproduces the data distribution well. So um, we propose like a, this is not new per se, uh, it's just useful macro to have. So we propose like a, a framework or, or a, cu a coupling framework. So let's say we have an arbitrary valid divergence between probability distributions. Like you may think of a KL divergence just for uh, simplicity. Um, 
then um, if such divergence is zero, let's say between a coupling that goes in a particular direction, you know, starting from pi t uh, times some q x given z, or starting from pi zero times some p z given x, right? Then we have a coupling, we have a transport in between the source and the target distributions, right? It's, this this is just restating the chain rule in or the product rule in this case because you just have two variables in terms of divergences. So there's not there's nothing new here. Um, so the you know the, the kind of thing that we can look at here is how both sampling and generative modeling fit in here. So if you if you set the unnormalized density to be pi capital as uh, is pi capital T in this framework and optimize with respect um, to pi theta then this is like just standard variational inference. Conversely, if you go the other way around, uh, you set pi zero to be p data, which is a usual convention with diffusion models, data is always on the zero uh, time index, uh, and optimize with respect to the other side of the KL. So in this case, you're optimizing, well, it doesn't have to be a KL, but in this case, you'd be optimizing a forward rather than a reverse KL. Then you have like a lot of the standard diffusion methods, at least in flavor. So, you know, both generative modeling can just be thought about, uh, and sampling can just be thought under this general divergence framework. And we'll go into more details to why this is useful. Right now, it's just a bit abstract. So yeah, I mean, like, like alluding back to the first problem, all we care about is we want to find some sort of coupling, some sort of transports between source and target distributions. And hopefully, they're easy to learn or they're nice to sample in some way. So let's start with like, a, you know, I mean, people are very familiar with this, I'm quite sure, but let's just start going over some already existing methods. So, you know, one, one approach is the uh, EULA, just the Langevin algorithm, right? Um, in this case, we would follow gradients of the target distribution um, and just add noise, right? And this can be shown to converge to the target distribution. Um, so, you know, this is pretty simple algorithm computationally, at least for a sampling, we have everything we need, right? We can evaluate grains of the target distribution, we can simulate this. So has a semi-okay convergence rate. So why don't we just uh, maybe stop here? Um, let's look at the algorithm a little bit more uh, in continuous time. And then these are not new results. These are quite uh, well-known results in the community. Is something that you can see about this algorithm is that it's mixing time here. So you can see this exponential factor and there's a constant C. Uh, depends on somewhat the complexity of the target distribution. Um, so, you know, in, in particular, uh, you know, if you have a very large well in the target distribution, two modes that are very far apart, this constant C is somewhat proportional to it. So this is undesirable because then you have to typically run quite long burning times uh, before you overcome this constant and start to get in the nice uh, exponential convergence. So yeah, another point was how can this be applied to generative modeling? Because uh, we don't have gradients of the, of the log data of a score of the target distribution. And I mean, this has been already done and it was alluded to in the previous talk as well, is um, this paper by Song, is that you can use the old score matching results um, to learn this, right? I mean, maybe some quick downsides to mention about this is that you need to estimate the trace of the function you're learning here. And this can be done with the Hutchinson's trace estimator, but it does introduce some variance. So, Point here is that you know there are two downsides to this. If you want to apply this process to generative modeling, you don't get such a nice loss um, to learn the score. And additionally, you do have this mixing time that is not ideal uh, for the sampling problem. And also for generative modeling, it applies. So maybe let's uh, flip gears a little bit and just intuitively, like what was you know the, the Langevin al algorithm doing? Is it was starting from a very easy. Uh, distribution, typically something we can sample from a pi zero, usually Gaussian, or people sometimes do some other tricks. And it tries to navigate that towards a more complicated distribution, right? And um, yeah, I mean, what, you know, one analogy like I like to have with these kind of things is that it's, you know, what it's trying to do is it's trying to uncrack, unmix an egg in a way, because you're, you're starting from something that has no structure and you're trying to bring structure into it. So maybe it's easier to, you know, go the other way around, play the video backwards, actually. So maybe start from your data distribution or, or your complicated posterior and transform that into a Gaussian and then figure out how to reverse that once you have generated these trajectories. So, so you know, to make this more concretely, let's like explore a little bit more on the theory of time reversal of diffusions. So if you have a particular stochastic differential equation, 
Um, let's say the first one that is traveling forward in time, it starts from pi zero. Then there's gonna exist a counter, like an alternative representation of this path measure that actually travels backwards in time. It starts from the terminal distribution of this one, goes backwards in time. And the two of them are related by the score, right? The score of the first one or the score of the second one as they both have the same intermediate marginals in, under this uh, representation. So the first, uh, let's say the, the time reversal drift is equal to the drift of the first one um, minus um, the scaled score of, of these uh, SDEs. So again, you know, discretizing just, just for concreteness here, like we can discretize both forwards and backwards SDEs. There's nothing special about this just to show that the, you know, reverse discretization of a, of a backwards SDE is, is not so different here. We'll be using that later. Um, so yeah, so here's a good question. Like co computationally, how can we, you know, if we have maybe parameterized two stochastic differential equations or one is fixed and another is parameterized, how can we enforce that these SDEs are reversals of one another? And again, we go back to our framework one actually. So if we take a divergence on a path space, so these are, divergence on the path distributions of the SDEs, then if this divergence is zero, um, you know, it follows quite trivially that you have a transport, but furthermore, these two stochastic differential equations are related uh, by one another through Nelson's relationship. So this is again, quite a straightforward thing. Um, and again, to, to make this result a little bit more practical, um, most divergence require, like it's a little note here, require computing Q over P or just the rather naked derivative between the two distributions um, that are arguments, the divergence. And so what we're gonna show now is what is that rather naked derivative, right? So in general, you have Gersanov theorem, which gives you the rather naked derivative between an SDE going in a forward time direction and an SDE going in a backwards direction. This result generalizes Gersanov theorem to when you have SDEs you know, that are not aligned in time. They're going in, uh, not aligned is a different uh, wrong terminology, but they're going in different time directions, right? One's going forward, one's going backwards in time. And so this gives us a nice generalization of uh, Gersanov theorem, um, which will actually allow us to derive or from our framework, like say from this framework one, this will allow us to derive a lot of existing uh, score matching objectives, just depending on what we set A or B to. Um, so yeah, so if we, you know, if we going back now to the um, general modeling or the kind of sampling form and targets is, you know, this is just the standard diffusion model what people call VPSDE is you start an OU process um, or some generalization of the OU process with 10 varying coefficients at your target distribution. You want to evolve this backwards in time and this converges to a Gaussian. And so this is the, you know, the, the known framework already. Um, from um, the song papers and just DDPM follows this as well. And you know, one advantage of, of this compared to the U algorithm that we were uh, we introduced initially is that you know you're going from the data distribution uh, to a to a Gaussian in this case. So now your target distribution is really a Gaussian. And so if you look at the mixing constant, it's just one, right? So we no longer have this, and this is not new. This is like well known, and if you look at a lot of diffusion model papers, you always see the X term without any any mixing constants in it, like diffusion model theory papers. And so, you know, just intuitively, this is quite nice because we don't have this need for the burning to over the burning runs to overcome the mixing time that we get from the Langevin algorithm. Um, so, you know, this is one reason why both for sampling, if possible, to use in sampling, and both for generative modeling we might prefer to use the OU process rather than learning the gradients of the target data distribution or doing EULA in the sampling context. So another alternative, I'll just drop this one in here because this one's based on Dube's transform, which we're not gonna have much time to talk about. Um, so is the variance shrinking process um, in sampling, in some sampling or some VI works, people call this the path integral sampler uh, or the Schrodinger former sampler because it's related to Schrodinger bridges. Uh, but it's it's kind of just a Brownian bridge, more or less, starting from a arbitrary distribution. So this SDE will converge to a fixed point, right? So different to the U process that converges to a Gaussian, this one converges to just, in this case, it's just zero, right? And so, you know, it takes the difficult distribution to something simple. If we can learn to reverse that, then we're done, right? 
in general, the um, the way that's done, the, the the like the song approach is another is to do score matching. Um, this approach is has a tractable objective for learning the score. This and this is in fact equivalent to um, the KL divergence we wrote up there, but we just fix one of the arguments. So we just fix one of the arguments here. For example, we fix B to be just a linear function, the OU process. And from that, you can recover the, the score matching objective exactly. Uh, you can also recover the implicit score matching objectives. So, um, you know, both processes can be learned this way, both the variance shrinking or the VPSD. There's also the variance exploding, which we don't cover in this talk. Um, so now we're going to switch gears a bit and we're going to look at, so it's just, just an overview of like, just at a high level, you know, how is uh, sampling or inference done in generous modeling? How do you train these models? Uh, the important thing here to take away is that in all these objectives, we need to sample from P data, right? In the context of sampling, we'd have to sample from the target distribution, which we can't do. All we can do is evaluate it. So all these losses um, that we use in generative modeling are not directly applicable uh, to sampling. And so this is what we're going to explore now. So just to give a little bit of context as well of, you know, we just mentioned this a second ago, if we take our framework and um, we kind of just plug in the, the setting of score matching, right? You have a forward process and then you have a forward process minus a parametric function that you want to learn. Uh, if we plug this into our Gersanov result, we can recover the implicit score matching loss. This is the first loss we looked at for le learning EULA. And then if we do similarly, plus some other steps, we can also recover the standard denoising score matching loss. Uh, I think, yeah, so that's uh, how with our framework, we can recover two standard generative modeling losses. We can also do the same thing for action matching and some variants of flow matching using this Gersanov result. So going a little bit forward is instead of, you know, uh, having the OU process be in the first argument of the KL, uh, if you consider having it in the second argument of the KL, so we flipped the KL, right? So now we have a reverse KL rather than a forward KL, and we optimize this objective with respect to uh, some score network. This still learns the, you know, the score of a uh, VPSD or the score of a OU process, but now it does not require sampling from the data distribution, right? So the samples here are taken with respect to the process that you're learning, um, which you can sample from using Euler Mariyama. It is a nonlinear SDE because you're learning it. Uh, there's a neural network in it. And so this is an objective that, you know, when minimized, um, will recover the OU process equivalent, but in the sampling context, basically. All right, so this will learn the time reversal of a VPSDE for a given uh, unnormalized density that you want to target. Uh, similarly, uh, so this method is called DDS, uh, which is we proposed it about a year ago and explored it uh, within the sampling problem. It has some advantages empirically uh, compared to EULA, as expected. Um, and similarly, there's also like the pin Brownian motion or this variant shrinking process that we discussed, which shrinks things into a delta. It can be parameterized about the same. So again, using our Gersano framework, we can recover this loss. Popularly in, the, in this VI community, this is called the path integral sampler, PIS and very similar looking loss, but again, it recovers the um, score of this kind of Brownian bridge-based uh, sampling approach. So, so far, like what have we done in terms of like just very high level methodologies for sampling, or these are VI approaches for sampling, but based on diffusion models or based on SDEs. So we've, you know, looked at following the gradients of the, of the target to reach our destination. That's quite slow, right? Um, we've also, you know, followed Gaussian targets to turn our target into a simple Gaussian and then reverse that. This seems to work pretty well. It does have an issue that, you know, you you're going to have this error um, and it pops up a little bit worse in sampling, right? It was mentioned in the previous talk. Again, this process never actually converges to the Gaussian. So its reversal is only approximately Gaussian. We need to sample from its reversal. So we use this as part of the objective. This introduces bias into the objective, introduces bias into the gradients as well. Um, so yeah, it has a little downside. And then the other approach is that, you know, we force our target distribution into a point and then try to reverse that. Um, one limitation of this is that you're always gonna start sampling from a, a value, specifically the number zero, and that might not have good coverage, right? You may need to, again, like in the previous talk, you might want a little bit more flexibility for a given custom problem. So can we think of another way uh, to navigate between source and target distributions that is, you know, not within these three methods? 
And um, that way is going to be quite similar, uh, again, to the uh, stochastic interpolants framework in that just at a very high level, a very conceptual level, we're going to pre-specify a flow or an interpolant. Um, but we, because we're working with sampling, we pre-specify that flow as a, you know, as a series of densities, right? Much more, much like a yield important sampling, we can just specify a tempering of that, you know, interpolates between our source distribution and our target distribution, right? Just, and linear interpolation is, is kind of like a straightforward thing to do, right? And then what we say is we would like to recover a stochastic differential equation, um, which at each point in time has the law, has as its law, this particular uh, interpolant, right? And such, uh, which reproduces the interpolant basically, right? And this thing here actually is, is again, akin to stochastic interpolant framework, it's very akin to uh, flow matching as well, because this can be rewritten directly as a like just very standard uh, continuity equation as well, if you want to remove the noise, look at its probability flow to you. So how do we go, given that we pre-specify this, which is easy to do, and we can always evaluate it up to normalizing constant, can we pre-specify uh, an annealed, a tempered distribution? How can we learn this SDE with an extra control term that will uh, have this, reproduce this particular uh, flow? So we go back to our framework. Uh, just checking the time, sorry, yeah. So we go back to our framework, our framework one, and if we minimize, uh, let's say a KL divergence, it can be any divergence again, it can be an F divergence, it can be the log variance divergence, but if we minimize the divergence between the SDE specified here, right? So this SDE here, and a reverse time SDE or a backwards SDE with the energy term or the, the annealing term flipped in sign. So it would be flipping the sign of this term. This will become a plus, for example. If we minimize this scale divergence, so if this scale is zero, then um, we can show that you recover um, a stochastic differential equation that reproduces this annealed distribution, right? So we call this objective uh, controlled Monte Carlo diffusion. And it's the, the main thing we will explore empirically from now on. Um, before going into that, I want to like highlight some interesting theoretical results that uh, came out of this. So we're able to relate uh, our approach somewhat to the fluctuation theorem or the Jarsinski equality. So defining like uh, uh, work done uh, in, in the classical way as done for SDEs. So it's just the time derivative of the potential integrated uh, along a, a time interval and free energy following the usual definitions, you know, free energy subscript time is just the log partition effectively. Um, using the general Gersano theorem, we can find the radon nicotine derivative uh, between, you know, the forwards. This is the same one going into the scale here. Uh, so the forward process and one with a sign flip. And this gives us something that looks already a lot like um, Crookes fluctuation theorem. The only difference is the C term, which is dependent on phi. So if we set this phi to zero here, we'd have the radon nicotine derivative between uh, EULA with a positive sign and EULA with a negative sign going backwards in time. This is just an yield important sampling for people familiar with the sampling literature. And this would recover exactly the fluctuation theorem. If you take an expectation, you recover exactly Jarsinski's equality. Um, this particular formula is already known as control Jarsinski, but I think we believe this is the first proof uh, concurrently. Uh, if you look at the paper, we do acknowledge um, another paper that came up with it concurrently, but this is the first proof for it um, uh, that we've seen. And here it's just like uh, using more standard notation that might look a little bit more familiar uh, in an MD sense, because uh, we wrote it more for just score matching and generative modeling. So what does our, our algorithm look like? Um, so this is, this is basically our objective uh, up to negative sign. So we simply, uh, we have to, yeah, we have to run in, we have to like uh, discretize our, our nonlinear SDE and simulate it forward in times. And we compute the R&D again, as we are going along. And you can see there's a sign flip. When you discretize the sign flip actually occurs on the neural network drifts, not on the EULA terms. And these, the expected value of these log weights, that's our, our objective, that's just simply the KL divergence. So this is the algorithm to compute the R&D. Once we have the R&D, we can just use any gradient method to minimize this. Um, we evaluate this over a series of kind of standard benchmarks for both uh, Bayesian inference, like computational Bayesian inference, uh, some toy examples, and we also explored uh, 
pre-trained normalizing flows because you know what their normalizing constants are. Um, we compare this to a few other, so like a lot of these other methods, path integral sampling, denoising diffusion sampler, uh, EULA, but also versions of EULA that are optimized using score matching. So like Monte Carlo diffusion, SMC, um, and also second order uh, methods too. So we, we did quite an extensive comparison across a, a lot of different Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo, Monte Car MCMC plus VI methods, um, SGMCMC VI kind of methods as well. And we found um, our proposed method to perform quite, quite strongly. Uh, in particular, we, for small, so K here is the number of steps. So the number of integration steps and for like very small integration steps, we actually like, outperform almost EULA at its best, which is pretty exciting. So this is part of like, part of the motivation behind this approach was that we want to find uh, a transport map or a stochastic differential equation that converges finite in time, very similar again to flow matching or stochastic interpolants. And wanted to see if, you know, if, if you do define such a process that com converges in a finite time horizon unlike uh, EULA or the OU process, does that actually maybe translate to less steps? Uh, empirically, and this is what we found uh, quite consistently across our experiments is that our approach worked very well for a small number of steps. Yeah. Um, so some other like mentions that we didn't cover because we did do a little bit of literature review um, and the focus was mostly focused on VI approaches. So it's important to, to highlight that there's been quite a few MCMC based approaches as well um, for uh, porting diffusion models over to sampling. Uh, some of these work by, for example, uh, trying to estimate the score using MCMC. So you have an inner MCMC loop, like an inner EULA loop, and then you use that score, you simulate that score to actually get samples from your target distribution. And it's, you know, they've had some success. Um, I wanted to check how much time was left. Uh, uh, you, you started at, uh, so you still have 10 minutes? Ten minutes. Okay, so I can rather than jumping to questions, I'll spend five more minutes on uh, connections of this to actual transport. So we spoke a lot about transport, <laughs> and you know, other than the fact that we're you know learning couplings between distributions, we never actually discuss connections to maybe EOT or things like this. And this is this was part of the work, but I, I just put it at the end of the talk in, in case um, in case yeah in case it wasn't uh, time allowing. So again, just reiterating like the the at a very high level, what a Schrodinger bridge is, is that um, it finds a coupling between two distributions, a source distribution, like here in the picture, and a target distribution. But it does so by, you know, like we said, there are many couplings that you can find. It's not it's not a unique problem to go in between two distributions, and we showed a few examples. Um, this one does solves the uniqueness problem. So before, like, we, we solved the uniqueness problem by either fixing one of the distributions, right? So if we do... Uh, Score matching with VPSDEs, we fix the forward process to be an OU process. Um, if we do a more like interpolance or flow matching approach, we fix the interpolating distribution to be something, and then we learn. So all of these make the objectives you know, somewhat unique. Um, the Schrodinger bridge does it a bit differently. Instead of fixing the source or the, uh, the, the forward or the backwards SDE or the interpolating SDE uh, process, what a Schrodinger bridge does is it minimizes a KL divergence subject to some reference process, some reference dynamics. It's like a prior SD if you want to think about it, maybe a little bit akin to the forward SD. But it does, it solves this problem with the constraints that the learned process has as its marginals the source and the target distribution, right? So this is in very simple terms what a Schrodinger bridge is. Unlike VPSD approaches, this is a finite time approach. So it will reach the target at time one and reversely it'll reach the, the source at time zero starting from a finite time. Um, typically you can write the objective like this um, through Grassano theorem, like or, or using some of our results. Uh, this is pretty standard or known. So, you know, you, you start from your, your target distribution or, or your source distribution, depending if you're writing it forward or backwards in time, uh, you minimize um, this is basically, you minimize the respect to A, the distance to your reference process. So that's all the KL is. So you you have these two constraints, but you're making sure that the new SD you learn is close to the given prior SD. Um, written discreetly, it's more or less the same. You just, you know, uh, quite a bit simpler. You have your reference process, you're minimizing, and you have your coupling constraint. And, you know, if you look at this, it's already very reminiscent of uh, entropic optimal transport. If this reference process is this 
a standard Gaussian and you will recover uh, entropic optimal transport. So like just Wasserstein two with a regularization term, right? Um, a typical approach for solving this is the synchron algorithm to solve this problem iteratively. And the synchron algorithm just alternates between two projections. So uh, the first projection only constrains the, the starting distribution, right? And it minimizes KL divergence between what you're trying to learn and the previous. Uh, so this would be the reference in the first iteration, for example. And then the next projection does something, again, very similarly. It minimizes the KL divergence subject to the previous iteration. But now the constraint is on the um, target distribution. So just alternating constraints, alternating these projections is has been shown uh, to converge to the solution of a Schrodinger bridge or an entropic optimal transport. Um, again, these, these have their dynamic equivalents, right? So these are using just the, the dynamic losses that we introduced earlier in the talk. So you could alternate um, the dynamic Schrodinger bridge. This is more generally called the IPF algorithm and do this. What we want to show now is that um, these synchron projections, so these are both forward KLs. Uh, if, if you look at how they're written, you know, you're at reverse KL, sorry, you're optimizing with respect to the first argument of the KL. What we want to kind of motivate very quickly is that the EM algorithm looks very similar to this. So the algorithm will take the framework one objective, so just the coupling, uh, the coupling objective, you know, we've got the chain rule written in two directions. We take some divergence. In this case, it has to be KL for this particular proof. And if you, you know, if you do alternating uh, optimizations between going between forwards and backwards KL, so it's still a bit different here, you know, the KLs here are on the same argument, but if you do, you know, these alternating optimizations that will give you the AM algorithm subject to the initialization point, this is, this gives you a unique solution. So what we're able to show actually is that um, the EM updates and the IPF updates correspond to one another, right? So EM equals sync form, um, if, if you want to look at it this way. Um, and that's kind of interesting because it, it kind of bridges two fields like EM and uh, EM is quite typically like uh, developed in the VI communities and IPF is mostly in the in the OT communities and well more recently in diffusion model and showing your bridge communities as well. And so this result kind of uh, unifies these two um, these two different algorithms that the updates are actually if you initialize both algorithms at the same starting point, they will converge to the same Schrodinger bridge. Um, so yeah, I mean that that's uh, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have questions in the audience? I will start with a question then. Um, so you argue for this uh, Monte Carlo controlled uh, diffusion. That's yeah. Uh, aims at, at learning the controls that will allow you to follow a tempered distribution, if I get this correctly. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So can you give us some intuition of why this would work better than other sampling algorithms that are following tempered distribution, like sequential Monte Carlo or annual important sampling? They go from this same uh, paradigm. So It's exactly the same paradigm, yeah. Yeah, so there's a, there's a small difference. So let's uh, let's look at annealed important sampling, because uh, this may be easy to talk about. Uh, so in annealed important sampling, it's actually going to be this equation that you see here, but with the phi zero, right? That's effectively it, right? And then you're going to use the the ratio, uh, just the density ratio to, um, to estimate um, the normalizing constant. So with annealed important sampling, there are two differences, right? Annealed important sampling never actually reproduces the interpolating flow, right? Because it's still running, so for each each annual distribution, you're still running EULA for a finite number of steps mm -hmm. if you're doing it that way. So if you look at the marginals of annealed important sampling, even in continuous time, if you just look at the annealed important sampling SDE, its marginals are not the interpolating flow, right? So annealed important sampling is not a finite time method. It's still an equilibrium method. It still needs to converge to an equilibrium distribution, at least in continuous time, right? If you have the optimum to this optimization problem, this phi, this will reproduce the interpolating distribution exactly every point in time. And more importantly, in the final point, capital time T, this will recover the target distribution. Whilst the yield important sampling, at least the process that you're simulating, does not do so, right? It it only, you know, it still has the ergodicity error uh, coming from the fact that you've not run an infinite number of steps. So this is a finite time method. That's how it's a bit different 
um, to an yield point of sampling. Another difference actually is, <laughs> this is maybe a bit cryptic to put it this way, but another difference can be seen in the R&D. And, and this, this was always one way to look at it. So the R&D for an yield important sampling is suboptimal from a variance perspective, right? The R&D is not equal to one uh, or not equal to the partition function, not equal to a constant, right? Because the, the reverse process used in an yield important sampling is just EULA, but starting from the target distribution going backwards in time, that's not the true time reversal of the forward process that you used in an important sampling, right? If you had the two time reversal, then this R&D would be one. The reason you'd want the R&D to be one is because that will give you very low variance when you're estimating partition functions. And this is one of the things we, we quantify empirically. So our approach allows us to basically learn a more optimal R&D than the one used in AIS. Um, it's not the first approach to do that. So there's the approach, if you just drop the C in our method, our method's called CMCD, there's another method called MCD, which just takes an yield important sampling and tries to just learn a better backwards kernel for it, such that you uh, have a more optimal uh, R&D uh, for important sampling um, in the variance sense. Um, but yeah, these are these are the main differences, right? The, the It'll be better from a variance perspective, more optimal from a variance perspective, and it is a finite time method, uh, unlike an yield important sampling, which is only converges in the limit. Does that answer the question? Yes, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have another quick question? Okay, if not, let's thank Francisco again.